Welcome back to the second part of my little tutorial on basic modeling techniques in answer set programming. My name is still Thorsten Sharp and I'm still using the end queens puzzle to illustrate these modeling techniques to you. In the first part of this tutorial, I started by introducing you to the end queens puzzle and then provided you with a basic encoding and answer set programming to solve this puzzle. So we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of, of this encoding and one advantage I'd say is that it is pretty declarative. On the other hand, we also saw that it does not really scale. Now, in the second part, we will be looking at encodings that are still declarative, but that allow to scale in a much better way. Before we look at an advanced encoding, let's first have a look at the basic encoding we used in the first part of the tutorial. Here it is. So we have a generator part, which allows us to guess an arbitrary subset of possible queen positions. And then we have a tester part that eliminates all invalid solution candidates generated by the first part. Now this structure, this generate and test structure, is also obeyed by our advanced encoding. Just that the induced combinatorics of the advanced encoding is much less than that of the basic encoding. So here also we have a generator part, which is this guy, and a tester part. However, here the generator is much more restricted and part of the constraints from the tester in the previous uh, basic encoding have been integrated in it. Let's take a closer look. Well, if you look at the first, at the first line, we actually see that this rule is a combination of a choice rule and a cardinality rule. So we fix a column and then we say that in this column we are only allowed to place exactly one queen and the same happens in the second uh, line uh, where we fix uh, a row and we are only allowed to put exactly one queen in this row and this exactly one is implemented here in both cases by adding this cardinality restriction to the choice we make here. Now as a result this subsumes these two integrity constraints, but also it subsumes this one because by the construction here, so we, we range from one to n and we can only place one queen in each row and in each uh, a column, we only also enforce that we must put n queens on the board. And the choices here are done per row and per line and hence we also implement this unrestricted choice over here. And now obviously the two remaining integrity constraints that uh, tell us that we are not allowed to put two or more queens on the same diagonals are implemented by these two integrity constraints here. Again, this is done by means of aggregation, choice rules uh, restricted by uh, cardinality restrictions. And so each of them tells us that we are it must not be the case, so we have an integrity constraint, it must not be the case that two or more queens are put on the same diagonal. The basic advantage of this encoding lies in, it, in its usage of aggregates. In our case, these are cardinality constraints. Expressions like this here, or like this, where we impose a constraint on the cardinality of the atoms true in the set before. Now the nice thing about aggregates is that in the best case, they actually comprise an exponential number of basic constraints. And this is also reflected in the grounding. If we take a closer look, we see that each rule gives rise to n ground rules, n here and n here as well. And then the aggregate as such contains a linear number of aggregates. This is also true for, for this set here, because once you fix the d, you can express the i in terms of the j and the, and the d, and you also get a linear number of atoms in this uh, set. Okay, now let's actually see how this is reflected in grounding. For this, let's just look at a very simple uh, instance of the queen's puzzle, the two queen's puzzle. So first of all, grounding the basic encoding, we see that its grounding is dominated by flat integrity constraints and doing the same for the advanced encoding. We also get two integrity constraints, and these are the first two, forbidding to put queens on the respective diagonals, and the, rema the remaining four ones are for the two columns and the two rows, 
forbidding horizontal and uh, vertical attacks and at the same time generating possible queen's positions. Okay, now that we have seen actually how the grounding differs, let's actually see how this scales. For this, let's actually look at a more ambitious instance of the N queens puzzle, the 14 queens puzzle, which we've already looked at in the first part of this, this video. And you may remember that there it took uh, roughly 16 seconds. Now the most important thing to uh, observe is that solving has already started, grounding was more or less immediate. That is, grounding as such was not the bottleneck in terms of time, but the constraints that were produced made CLASP look at the problem for more than 16 seconds. And now this is confirmed here by the timings. We see that we spent altogether more than 16 seconds and almost all of the time went into solving. Now if we do the same with our advanced encoding, we get an answer immediate and well, solving was, well, was not visible and well, also grounding more or less did not really add to this. Now just to uh, round things up, let's look at the, at the grounding time as well. Let's just count the number of resulting constraints. So for our basic encoding, we obtain uh, 8,500 constraints and for our advanced one, uh, r well, roughly 500. Well, 8,500 constraints is not that big in terms of grounding, so this is ground actually pretty fast. Let's actually inspect what happens within the solver with the resulting constraints. To do this, we simply launch CLASP with the option minus minus stats which will give us information about the resulting problem before and after pre-processing as well as the search that was accomplished. First of all, you may have noticed that I actually launched CLASP on the advanced encoding. That's why we got actually an immediate result. So here we were faced with 774 rules and 381 atoms to begin with. Then after pre-processing, CLASP reduced this to 200 26 constraints and 224 variables. Now, I will not go into this pre-processing and let's rather look at the search. So the next part here describes actually the search that was accomplished. Looking at the low number of choices and low number of conflicts confirms that we have been dealing with a pretty easy search problem. Also the model level with seven is pretty shallow. The model level tells us that the solution was found at decision level 7, that is only 7 decisions are needed to reproduce the solution by a propagation. This of course changes drastically once we deal with our basic encoding. That is, we tackle the same problem but now with our basic encoding. And well, now we wait 16 seconds or let's jump in time. In the meantime, Clasp has actually solved our problem but look how much work he had to do. He had to do more than a million of choices and faced almost 800,000 conflicts. These are several orders of magnitude more than with the uh, advanced encoding. On the other hand, we only have 8,000 rules leading to 4,000 constraints, so only one order of magnitude uh, more constraints than with the basic encoding. So aggregates really, really help on this.